online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You're about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Hello, and thank you for joining us. Today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online is an encore presentation. It's some of our best ghost stories of all time. Didn't want to leave you high and dry without an episode, so today you get some of the best real ghost stories that we've ever heard here on Real Ghost Stories Online. Feel free, if you have a real ghost story, to call it in at 855-853-4802, or of course, you can always just write into the website, Real Ghost Stories Online. Dot com. Enjoy today's encore presentation of Real Ghost Stories Online. Real Ghost Stories Online. Uh, let's go to uh, another letter. This one comes to us from Oscar Mendoza. Uh, the title of his story, he says, is Zombie Ghost Clown. I can't think of anything more creepy than that concept. That's all your favorites wrapped in one. Zombie Ghost Clown. All right. Hi, my name's Oscar. I currently live in Dallas, Texas, and I believe in ghosts because I have seen them. I know what you think, zombies, really, but my story is true. I've never seen a ghost until I experienced this event when I was nine years old. Now, I'm a father of two kids and a responsible adult. The events in my story are true and have shaped my life, and to this day, I'm scared to go back to my parents' hometown. As a child, we traveled to Mexico with my parents and grandparents, and we always stayed in my grandparents' summer house, which is located next to the town's main street. Our summer house has been in, a, uh, in my family for generations. The main street was used for special events like parades and festivals, especially in the summer. Me and my cousins loved going to Mexico because of the carnival. We always arrived during San, the San Felipe Fiesta, which includes a circus, roller coasters, music, dancers. As kids, we'd wander up and down the street eating and riding rides. As you can see, we really love traveling to my parents' hometown in the summer for on vacation. This is where my story begins. In one of my many trips to San Felipe, I believe I just turned nine years old at the time. I was not the oldest and not the youngest in the group of kids, but I was old enough to remember every ugly detail. I remember seeing or sitting on the roof of our balcony at my grandparents' house to see the circus parade passing in front of our house. My grandparents' house was an open roof villa with three floors and each floor had two bedrooms and a, the kitchen was located and their ground floor next to the garden. To our horror, one of the circus cars carrying the clown lost control and tossed all of the clowns in front of our house. My older brother, who was 10 years old at the time, thought it was part of the show, so he started to laugh and point. So we all joined him because to us, it looked staged. We realized it was not a joke. When an ambulance showed up, we ran down the stairs to take a closer look at the accident. My brother was the first to see the bodies, and again, my brother mocked the dead clowns, thinking it was funny. I was horrified and sick to my stomach. Suddenly, my brother jumped back and ran inside, scared. I asked him why he ran inside, and he said one of the clowns turned to look at him and winked his eye. My parents arrived, and they explained to us what happened, and we should pray for the poor clowns. It turned out the entire clown group were thrown from the car and instantly killed. My older brother told my parents that it was impossible because one of the clowns turned to look at him and winked. See, my brother was kind of a bully and loved to make up stories, so my parents didn't believe him. My, my grandparents owned this ugly old dog that stayed with them at all the time. The dog was a huge, friendly, sweet, shaggy black dog. We loved him very much. He would be our companion while we explored the old town. My grandfather was a tough military man who always carried a gun and wasn't scared to speak his mind. Our room in the villa was located in the first floor next to my grandparents' room. All the rooms had metal doors that locked from the inside. Our room also had a huge wood door with a baseball-sized hole that opened in the kitchen. The door was really heavy, but it was easy to open. Generally, just a push would be enough to open the door. The night after the accident, all my cousins shared a huge king-size bed. At the time, I stayed in the room with my brother, younger cousin who was six, and my older cousin, Naomi, who at that time was 15. My cousin, Naomi, was our baby sister. She usually never slept with us, but my older brother asked her to stay because he was scared of the dead clown. So she agreed and stayed with us. 
Around three in the morning, my brother woke up to really uh, uh, a cold sweat. So he asked my older cousin to go with him to get some water from the kitchen. My cousin at first said no, but later she finally got up and went with my brother. I was still in bed with my younger cousin. From my viewpoint, I could see the big wood door straight into the kitchen. When my cousin opened the kitchen door, we all saw it. At first, I couldn't make out what I saw in the kitchen. It was a man sitting on a chair in the kitchen looking towards the kitchen wall. He had on a clown suit with big shoes and bright white hands stained in blood. He looked dirty and wet. From my viewpoint, I only saw the back of a man's head wearing what I thought was a bloody clown mask. My cousin screamed and slammed the door. My brother and my older cousin leaned against the door, preventing whatever was outside from getting in. Suddenly, something pushed the door with a force that moved the wooden door so violently, the door cracked and snapped. I jumped and helped them back to the door. My little cousin started crying and screaming. By this point, my older cousin started to cry and call for our parents. It seemed like an eternity, but whatever was outside put his body, his bloody hand, in the hole of the door trying to reach us. Then it stopped. Then we saw its bloody eye in the hole in the wooden door. It looked like a bloody gray marble. And he told us in Spanish, let me in children, I just want to play. Don't laugh at me. Suddenly, my grandfather came out of his room with a shotgun and released his big dog. The thing outside the door stopped pushing on the door. Then we heard the dog fighting with the thing in the kitchen. Then heard a whimper and everything went quiet. My grandfather walked into our room and opened the big wooden door. The only thing we could see was the body of our old dog with his head snapped. Then we heard a loud crash outside like something jumped from the balcony to the street below. But that was impossible because my grandparents' house was surrounded by concrete streets and stone paved road. Anyone that jumped to the street would seriously get hurt. Everyone in the villa woke up and called the police. The police came over and found nothing. No broken windows, no ladders, no jump on the balcony. Whoever came inside the house did break in but already was in the house. Again, that was impossible because our dog would have smelled him out. The kitchen smelled like a dead animal and the seat was covered in black liquid. Later that night, I overheard my grandfather talking to the police investigator, and he claimed to see a man wearing a bloody clown costume, but that was impossible because all the clowns died in the accident. The police investigator told my grandfather to pray because it have been El Diablo, the devil. We never returned back to my parents' old villa. To this day, my brother and my cousins tell their friends the same story, but no one ever believes us. I can tell you one thing, whatever we saw was not a person. Even my grandfather was spooked. The next day, my grandfather invited a priest to bless our house. My brother never really recovered from this experience. We've had several nervous breakdowns and counseling. Thank you for listening to this horrible experience. I have other scary stories I've experienced. Let me know if you want to hear any more. Yes, I, I'd like to hear more. I do. I hate that they saw that as children. I mean, just to see the accident is enough to mess a kid up. Sure. But then to have that happen, that that would push me over the edge. I can tell you that. I think it's one of the creepiest stories we've ever had on the show. Yep. Oscar, you win. <laughs> that is, that's one for the archives. Yes. That's one. Gosh, I think that's one we should bring back on Halloween. Um, my God. So, yeah, I want to hear your other stories because that was one hell of a story. Um gosh i don't even know how to react to that i, I mean i it, don't either it's it's like something out of a movie so i do understand why when you tell people this they don't believe you um but i i guess i i'll say i believe you i believe I believe you believe what happened, and I think something like that certainly happened to you. Well, that and all of them had that happen. And, and the, yeah, for multiple the brother, people, yeah. For the brother to continue to have nervous breakdowns, not only the stress of dealing with that, but then yeah. not being able to share what you experienced because people not believing you, I can totally see I mean, how do you that. go into a psychiatrist's office and tell them that story? I think you'd have to find one that specializes in, in parapsychology. Yeah. It, wow, that was, 
I don't think I've been speechless after a ghost story. I don't think I've ever heard you be speechless. That's... That was great. Yeah, <laughs> that was. That's a great story. I mean, a horrible story, but a, that was creepy as hell. I mean, the whole time, just the... It was just filled with the images that ran through my mind of just the worst things I don't want to see. Yeah. I mean, a little clown eye looking through a... That's... that. It's, it's interesting because zombies are a topic that... I kind of, you know, I love zombies. I, I was a zombie for Halloween every year as a kid and including as an adult, pretty much any year I've dressed up. Um, but it's always been a topic and a thought that I've just never really put much credence to as far as being a legitimate ghost. Just because, I mean, a zombie's a zombie. You know, I, I don't really think the poss- I never really fear walking through a cemetery and a hand's gonna come up and the undead are gonna start walking around. No, I don't I don't have that fear, but I do have the fear of like the bath salts guy in Miami that ate the other guy. Sure. Something I could see or that. or a mutation of a disease or somehow we've built up an immunity through all the antibiotics or some crazy thing that we we do every day ends up turning us into yeah. a zombie type person, not a traditional come back from the dead because I don't think that's going to happen but the whole yeah. acting like that I, I could see something like that happening but this thing though almost sounds like a zombie yeah yeah it does it's probably it's probably it probably does honestly if we're to to classify anything if those bodies were taken away they were taken away I doubt it was the actual body of the clown that was killed if anything it was like some sort of demonic entity that was festering you know and maybe one of the clowns was involved in something pretty dark and in real life yeah. and then that in essentially came back oh, i don't know what was the black liquid on the chair and did the police test it and what was that yeah that's a good question because to have a, a some kind of physical residue yeah. that's well there is a such thing as ectoplasm um, and that's been uh, found in real haunting sites and whatnot. And essentially it just ends up being like kind of a benign protein of some sort. Okay. Um, that essentially it's kind of, it's wrap, you know, equated to something that you naturally find in nature of just kind of a slimy substance. Um, but it does exist okay. in, in haunting cases. So when you, you do see the, uh, the Ghostbuster slime or Amityville with slime on the walls or something. There is a basis to that in reality. Okay, that, see, I didn't know that. I thought that was just for movies. No, there actually, that does occur. It's rare, but it does occur. Okay. So that's that's my guess as to what that likely would be. And then they bottle it and sell it to children. But uh, no, but then it, seriously, it does exist. Okay. Real Ghost Stories Online. Uh, 855-853-4802. That's our phone number. Let's go to another call. Hello. Good morning, afternoon, evening, Tony. Hello, Jenny. Hello, pair of peeps. <clears throat> this is Tim Z from Wilmington, North Carolina. So it is October. It's Ouija Awareness Month. And it is, I figure, well, the most important point, it, the NHL National Hockey League has started two days ago. So it is time, finally, for my haunted ice rink story. Have a seat, Tony. <laughs> I told you about this, I don't know, months ago. Um, I uh, I hope everybody caught that blood moon um, last week, this week, last week. It was a blood moon and a, a full eclipse. It was awesome. Um, so I work at an ice rink. I've been there for 10 years. It was, I actually helped build it. I put all the boards up and, and the glass and everything. So 10 years ago, we about to celebrate our 10 year anniversary this month. Um, this story probably happened, I don't know, a year ago, and it was with a couple trusted coworkers. Um, I believe it was at least two, possibly three people that experienced this. Now, <clears throat> it's a single sheet ice rink, a single sheet of ice. It's a small rink, no bleachers, snack bar. There, there's a snack bar, there's a pro shop, it's a small rink. Um, so these guys were hanging out. It was, they were done. They were, they were the closers. And excuse me, I'm on my way to work. It's extremely early. Um, so if I ramble, I, I apologize. You guys know me by now. I'm a rambler. Um, so these guys were closing. There was a guy and a girl. And I think there was a third person, but 
it doesn't it doesn't matter. So to explain the rink just real quick, it's it's like I said, a single sheet. And to leave the ice rink, there is um, there's like a foyer area when 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 you come in and when you leave. Um, and there's like bars between the entrance and the exit. It, it's kind of confusing, but so there's double swinging doors to go into the foyer, like push doors, metal, and then to walk out there is to walk into the outside. It's the glass with the push bar, the double doors with the metal push bar in the middle. So these guys <clears throat> had just closed up and they were standing outside having a smoke. So if anybody's familiar with an ice rink, they know that the doors to get onto the ice surface, um, like the, the doors that are on the boards, they've got heavy steel latches. I mean, these the kids can't really operate them. They're, they're decently heavy. It's, it's not easy to open and close. Okay, so these guys are standing outside, and they hear the door, it's just a single door to the ice surface, the one by the snack bar. They heard it open and close. I mean, that's a distinct noise. It, it can't happen on its own. Um, so they heard that, and they kind of, like, what? You know, in, in the what phase in their mind. And then the next thing they hear, almost simultaneously, um, was those metal doors, the double swinging doors into the foyer area. And at this point, they're looking at each other, you know, raised eyebrows. And <laughs> the next thing that happened, they were, they were kind of expecting this at this point or scared of it. The glass double doors to the outside were actually locked. They saw them move. They heard them move like somebody was trying to get out. And there was obviously nobody in the rink. Um, so it went the metal, the, the, the big heavy board door onto the ice with the metal latch and then the swinging doors and then the glass doors. They could actually see them like, and hear them opening, but they were locked. So, you know, you push on them and, and they're locked, but they do move a little bit. Um, they were really freaked out. <clears throat> My buddy Brendan was working. He actually came in. Now... My rambling has been worth it because I have left one part of the story out on purpose. I've been back there. Um, I left for years, but then got rehired back, thank God. Um, about two months before I started back, there was a guy playing men's league at night, and he literally, I don't know if he had a heart attack, but he literally died on the ice. He was expired when they pulled him off the ice happened in front of everybody. So you take you take that for what it's worth. Um, it's one of the most believable experience. I didn't experience it, but it's it's one of the most believable experiences that has happened around me that, that I'm associated with. Now, about two months ago, no, it was back in April, excuse me, because it was for a little tournament we had. I was just standing up in the front area, in that front foyer area, hanging out with the people that were working, that were working <clears throat> and leaned my head into the, um, the window into the office where the people pay and everything and heard three, uh, I don't think it's a holy trinity type mocking, but I heard three distinct like metal on metal banging. It's a metal, it's a metal building, but it was um, like just banging. And it was like up, as you would leave the office to walk outside through the door it would be like up over it to the to the left diagonally, and it was like nobody could be out there hitting a stick. I mean, it was it was up kind of high, and instantly while he heard it, thought of the story, you know, that I just told you. It was like maybe it's Rich, and um, that's the guy that passed away, and walked outside nothing. So I truly believe that rank is haunted. He was a good guy. We just talked to him like normal. Um, I mean, not like we go in there and talk to him all the time, but it's just it, it, there's no no ominous, malevolent, malevolent. Say that, Tony. Um, it, it's not a. I don't think there's a bad spirit in there. Um, now, real quick, I hope I I hope I hope I don't get cut off, but um, 
<laughs> I almost called you when this happened, but it's not a ghost story. It's something scary, but it's not a ghost story. Two weeks ago, there was a Marine playing. There's a Marine team up from Jacksonville, North Carolina. Uh, awesome guys. <clears throat> but he was he was mostly ready. He had his skates on and everything, and just about halfway ready. And he reached down to get something in his bag, and something was not right. Well, the thing that was not right was a live possum in his bag that he had brought all the way, an hour and a half down the road from Jacksonville to Wilmington. He decided to transplant a, po a possum. So I, I thought that was hilarious. So he had a he, he zipped up his bag and had his buddy take it outside. So guys, I really appreciate everything you do. Everybody out there, Richard, Mary, Cisco, Tractor Girl, Sir Edward. I'm trying to remember everybody I can think of right now. You guys are awesome. Let's keep this going. And uh, the cruise, let's plan for 2015. We're doing the, the paranormal cruise. I'm going to be the shuffleboard winner. You guys take care. I'm hanging up. Bye. We're going to if we can find a ghost ship to do a uh, a cruise on, a, a haunted ship. Oh, they're probably in like the, they'd be really expensive though. Yeah. They'd be like the, the, the Queen Mary or something with. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, so that, there we go. That's the haunted ice rink story that he's been talking about for so long. And it's pretty creepy, especially when you think about the the, the doors in secession. Just like somebody's leaving the yeah. ice. Wow. Yeah. I wonder if it is that, uh, did he say that that gentleman who passed away was prior to this happening or? What do you mean? The gentleman who passed away at the ice rink. Uh-huh. Did he say that that man passed away uh, before the haunting incident or after the haunting incident? No, it was it was okay. Before. So he was attributing it to the the haunting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I could very well see, especially with such a new building. Yeah. You know, oh, very interesting. I find it interesting though that a ghost tries the doors. I mean, I completely believe the story. It's yeah. just like. They can just go through things. Why? <laughs> Why mess Maybe with the doors? Maybe it was actually trying to get attention. You know, that could was be. it was his point. It was you know an accessible thing that could be manipulated, and if he did that, it, you know, it just has the conscious you know thought of well, I'm going to let them know it's not just one door that just happens to be moving here. If I do all of these in a row, they're going to think there's a person that's doing this. It's true. Real ghost stories online. Donna writes in, "Hi Tony and Jenny, I absolutely love your show and listen all the time. I have a couple of stories to share, but we'll tell you." Only one today. Here's my story. This took place back in the mid-70s when I was about seven. I lived in a beautiful dead-end road in a small main town. It was the day after Halloween, which makes it even a bit spookier in my mind. I remember that Halloween, my mom and dad dressed me up in the coolest mummy costume with ripped-up coffee-stained sheets from head to toe over my big boots. I thought no one would recognize me, and I liked that. The night we trick-or-treated down our road getting our fill of candy, we came to the Keens house, a kind of elderly couple that we'd often do favors for and receive uh, caramels for payment. Mr. Keens' hand was shaking wildly as he dumped a handful of yummy caramels in my bag. It scared me a little. He smiled and recognized it was me, calling me his little redhead. The next morning, after sneaking a bit of candy for breakfast, I hopped on my bike with my friends, as we always did, the and, and rode through the breezy fall leaves. There were four of us, just having fun riding around. Then it happened. We reached the end of the dead-end road, and all saw Mr. Keene standing on his porch, in his plaid shirt and his suspense. We waved and yelled out hi to him. But strangely, he didn't move or acknowledge us. A cold chill went through my body, and tears filled my eyes as I realized something was very wrong. He was transparent. In a panic, and without a word, we all pedaled as fast as we could to our homes. When I reached my front steps, I ran in crying that something was wrong with Mr. Keene. My mom was having coffee with a neighbor and tried to calm me down. I explained what we had seen when she told me that Mr. Keene had passed away the night before. I felt the blood leave my face. My mom still recalls this day, and we've spoken about it several times. I even reconnected with one of my childhood friends on Facebook. I was there that day, and sure enough, she repeated the story as she remembered to me, and it was identical. Because of this, I've always believed in ghosts. I have no doubt. 
That's a good story. Especially since it was around Halloween, you know? Yeah. And it's like he was just kind of saying goodbye or doing his thing and getting ready to pick up and leave and head to his next destination. That was a really good story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 855-853-4802. That's our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. You can call in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Or you can write into us through the website at realghoststoriesonline.com. If you're not an EPP yet, please consider becoming one. Real Ghost Stories Online. 855-853-4802 with your Real Ghost Story. Matt's writing in. Dear Tony, I've been listening uh, to the show now for a while. I subscribe and wondered if this story might be of use to you. I'm very interested in the paranormal, uh, though my default setting is a happy skeptic. I'm the type of guy who would love it all to be true, but I just can't seem to see it. I can be a a very uh, somber type of person, so the thought of some magical, mysterious world is a great hope for me, but despite several personal quests and many more planned, I don't have any evidence. I've written a book about my hunt for the truth on the paranormal, my first, and it will be out at Christmas if I can get my act together. Okay, so the story. I have to go back a few years to the period after 9-11 and all the craziness that followed. During this time, I traveled all over with work and socially. One of my friends lived about an hour from my home in Kent, and I would drive there and back and he had, as he had no transport. Around 2003, 2004, I was driving along a road in Essex, England, and about two in the morning. At the time, I was on my way back from the friend's house and was completely sober. My friend lived in a place called Stableford Abbots out of the countryside. During the drive out there, it was daylight, uh, and I found my way there easily, but coming back, it was pitch dark and getting misty, and even with my headlights on at full, it was difficult to see. I took it easy as it was getting more foggy and I didn't want to have a crash in the middle of nowhere. Ahead of me, I suddenly saw something in the middle of the road. At first glance, I thought it was a person standing there in the road. I slowed and began to approach it, trying to avoid killing someone. The road is called Stapleford Road. I think I'll, I I think, but I'll check before setting this on. It's very dark with lots of fields and trees and open, lonely spaces. You can imagine what it looked like in the fog. I didn't feel scared, but I was worried I'd hit someone, so I slowed down to about 15 miles an hour approximately. As the car edged closer, I could see a line of mist across the road, thicker than the fog around it, and raising to a peak in the dead center of the road. I'd never seen anything like it before, and was nervous to drive through it as it looked weird. I could see it was just thick mist, but it stood tall, easily the height of a man, and very obvious against the thinner mist all around it. It most certainly did not look like a classic ghost or human being, for that matter, but it didn't look natural either. I didn't stop the car or anything dramatic like that. Instead, I drove forward at the same slow speed and passed straight through it. Sadly, here's the cliché part of the story, which just screams horror film, but I'll tell just like it happened. The moment I passed through it, I felt the uh, fight-or-flight urge in my stomach. I could tell instinctively, instinctively, that I needed to move along quickly, and I recall seeing the hairs on my arms stand up and feeling that prickly fear that comes on suddenly when you get spooked. I sped up a bit and looked back in the mirror, and sure enough, it was still there. No arms or legs just uh, or features, just a man-sized column of mist against swirling fog. Almost immediately, it faded into the pitch black and everything else, as only my front and rear lights gave any hint of the road and surroundings. Nothing happened for the rest of the journey home. I obviously felt creeped out and a bit jumpy, I suppose, but once I was away from it, I felt safer. I forgot about it until I was watching an old rerun of US TV show, Sightings. It was something about ghosts and spirits, and there was a man named Peter James who reminded me of Einstein a little bit. He had mad fuzzy gray hair and a thick jet black mustache. His real character, and claimed to be able to speak to spirits of the dead and interpret ghostly appearances. I didn't really consider that I'd seen a ghost, but I was sure that what happened was pretty weird. A lot of the stuff they were talking about on the show didn't seem too dissimilar to my own experience, so I decided to try to ask Peter what he thought of it. In all honesty, I had seen the sighting show during its original run years earlier and remembered how entertaining I thought Peter James was then. I just had a feeling that despite how wacky it sounded, 
to be writing a ghost buster, Peter might be the type of person to give me a decent opinion. I found contact details and wrote asking if there was anything to that lonely 2 a.m. 2 a.m. encounter beyond the very scary fog. There wasn't a reply for days, and I felt a bit stupid having even raised it, but didn't tell a soul I'd written to him. By the end of the week, I'd written it off completely. However, but a week later, I got a message from Peter in which he asked if he could call me. I did give him my number. I was pretty taken aback, but the very next day, my phone rang, and it was none other than Peter James, the psychic, calling me from America. We exchanged pleasantries and had a conversation, nothing to do with ghosts, and I got the sense that he was really a nice fella. To cut a long story short, he told me to go back to the place during the days as there was probably something there that would help me understand what it was all about. He didn't outright say, yes, it was paranormal, but he told me that sometimes spirits present themselves on anniversaries or at locations of familiar familiarity or great tragedy. For me, the spookiest part of the story is that I didn't tell Peter where this had all happened, only that it was in England in the countryside. The spookiness will become apparent as I explain what happened. I agreed to have a look and keep Peter posted, and I came away amazed that the guy had called me on his own phone bill simply to give me some advice. I never met him, and we only exchanged an email a few times after that, but he felt compelled to reach out to me after my message, and something, he said, still sticks in my mind. I feel there may be something trying to reach out to you. The sense he got was that it could be a case of a spirit in pain. Again, it was not specific or concrete, but Peter told me that what he felt was that his senses gave him at that time. Now, I have a saying, it goes, I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm frightened of them. Once Peter told me that, I was once again creeped out. My position on the paranormal is that I don't believe it's real, but wish it was. My life has been fulfilled by that passion for mystery of the unknown, but I've never found anything to convince me of its existence. We can all recount a ghostly experience here and there and a spooky moment, but who among us can say they know there is something to give it proof? I wasn't going to run away with the whole thing and kept an open mind. It was a buzz to connect with Peter, but beyond being a little starstruck to meet him, I didn't honestly think that the mist was a tortured soul, though I was nervous in case something was reaching out to me. It was quite a while before I thought about it and, proper, uh, and properly again, but the next time I drove out there to see my friend, I stopped near where I saw the mist. I couldn't see anything even remotely revealing about the area and headed off just a few minutes later. About 20 feet from where I'd seen it, I noticed something as I drove away. Now, I fully admit that it was not the exact location, but it was extremely close. On the side of the road was a small plaque. I couldn't read it from where I was, so I parked again and walked over. I can only paraphrase what it read as it was so long ago, but it said something like, Here fell Office Officer Gutteridge. And it gave a date nearly a hundred years or so when a policeman was killed in the road. As I read it, I half expected to hear the theme tune to the Twilight Zone or something playing. It freaked me out so much. There was a little slip road named Gutteridge Lane in honor of him, which ran in the crescent around the memorial plaque just off the main road I'd been driving on that night. The man was killed at the end of September, about 80 years or so earlier. I was also driving along the road sometime at the end of uh, September of 2003, 2004. Even for a non-believer, a fascinated non-believer, I should add, I was struck by the notable details. I had seen a very odd form at that point on the road, less than 20 feet from a plaque of a grisly murder. I started to wonder if the plaque might just have been a general location of honor, or if perhaps what I saw was the actual spot. I tried not to be a drama queen about it and write up on the story of the police officer. It was really grotesque, but on the Essex police website, they have a page about his murder. The killers had shot him in the neck. As he lay dangling, they shot him again, once in each eye. Apparently when he was found, he had two gaping holes for eyes. It was a horrendous sight. I could barely believe it was a true story, but there was no hint of the horrific past in that posh part of the Essex countryside, save for a very small plaque not easily noticed from the road. Had I never bothered to write to Peter, I'd never have followed this 
what reruns of old TV shows can do if the right person watches them. As a footnote of all this, for me, it's not proof of the supernatural or anything other than a series of rather creepy coincidences that I was never convinced I'd seen the policeman's ghost, and I'm still not. Even now, I'm not ruling out it out, but I saw nothing which had a seal or real sighting and gave me a smoking gun. It was an interesting brush with the world of psychics and the brilliant Peter James, and I've always been very grateful that he entertained me and this silly note that I sent him, which I felt silly sending anyway. In the end, I was glad I did make it out there. It made me think. It made me think a lot, and always to keep an open mind. Peter died just a few years after our brief correspondence, and I felt very honored to have investigated a creepy country lane in Essex with him, even if it was only over the phone. It doesn't matter what I believe. Every time I drive past Gutter Ridge Lane, the hairs on my arms stand up at the very thought of that cold, foggy September night when I saw the mist. I think Peter knew that it was a paranormal event, and that's why he wanted the author to go back. Yeah, I think he sensed it, and I think that's why he sent him back over there. I think that makes total sense. And I also wonder, being that it was such a vague figure, if that had something to do with the fact that it happened so long ago. Like, we've been talking about how the energy just kind of fades and dissipates over time. Real Ghost Stories Online. Uh, the phone number to call in if you have a real ghost story is 855-853-4802. 855-853-4802 to share your real ghost story with us here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Let's go to a letter. This one comes into us from Todd. And uh, Todd writes in, I bought my former house in 2006, an older home built in 1925. I love history and older homes, so I always do some research on the places I buy. Found out that the home was built by a doctor, and he may have used it for some of his practice. Let me assure you that I had never noticed anything strange in my house. I had a friend who rented out the second story who claimed to hear voices, footsteps, and bangs in the first floor at night. I, however, did not believe her. A few years ago, I began researching the paranormal with a small group of friends. I am a skeptic at best, I believe, but disbelieve something needs to slap me in the face in order for me to believe it. And even then, I sometimes don't believe it to be real. I purchased a new piece of equipment for the investigations, an EMF detector called a K2 meter. It measures electromagnetic fields and had never really used it before. I invited a friend over to my house to test it out, give it a try. What happened that afternoon changed my mind about my house. We started out with the meter, checking for stray voltage in my older home. Nothing really stood out as an issue. Then we started asking questions. For about 15 minutes, we asked the typical, is there anyone with us today? If you're with us, please come close to us and let us know of your presence. Nothing. Deader than a doornail. What does that mean anyway? I got up and out of the room, and started doing dishes. My friend continued her questioning. Let me say that my friend calls herself a sensitive. I typically call her crazy, but I digress. At some point in her questioning, she asked me to rejoin her. As she was starting to see the lights blinking in response to her questions, I joined her, but said nothing. Over the course of about 45 minutes asking yes and no questions, my friend determined that we were in the presence of a 65-year-old man who was a professional. She couldn't determine if he was a doctor or a lawyer. She also believed that his name was Charles. After sitting there in amazement, the lights started blinking less and less until finally they went off all together. The conversation was over. I sat there, still in disbelief. There must be stray voltage in my house. A plane overhead was making the lights blink. The batteries were already weak and needed changing. All of those thoughts went through my head, even though we may have found out that the energy with us may have been a doctor. And even though the name was Charles, the tra name Charles was the first name of the doctor who built the house and had his practice there, I still didn't believe. Since the conversation was over, we began talking about work and complaining about the company who gave us a check every other week. At that moment, both my friend and I distinctly had heard several steps go down the hall upstairs. The entire home had hardwood floors, and the hallway upstairs ran the entire length of the home, as did the hallway on the first floor. After seven or eight deliberate steps, a door slammed. I sat there, my jaw wide open. 
So was my friend's job. I, however, had tears welling up in my eyes. This had never happened before in my house. No one was upstairs. No one had lived upstairs for about a year. There had never been those types of sounds in my home. A building that never creaked and groaned and was built solid. Who's upstairs, my friend asked. As a tear rolled down my cheek, I whispered, no one. Nothing happened in my home again for a few years. Then another friend, someone else who claimed to be sensitive, visited, and things happened again. To be continued. <laughs> wow. And here's a question for us both. Do these things uh, always exist almost everywhere, but only are known because certain people with certain energies help bring them out? I'm beginning to wonder. I think that might be part of it. I think that's why some people can see things and have experiences and others can't. Yeah, it's kind of, I, I would think almost to the thought process of they know who can see them. Mm -hmm. And when there is someone there, especially someone that they may have been trying to communicate with, someone who continually denies that they're there or pretends or likes to right. deny you know, somewhat, but is, is kind of on the fence, uh, like Todd there, um, they may just see that as, oh God, this person's here. If I can put on quite one hell of a show today for this person, maybe I can get my person, essentially, it's almost like they're the pet of sure. the house, to realize and acknowledge that I exist. Okay. That's my thoughts on it. I think they know who can see them and who can't. I agree with that. And I think some people will just rationalize themselves out of any possibility. Mm. I mean, there's no way to rationalize footsteps and a door slamming when there's yeah. nobody upstairs. Well, and the thing is, okay, I gotta say, I, I know Todd, I've known Todd for years. Todd is, was actually uh, my first boss in, in the world of radio. Oh, this is that this Todd? This is Todd. Well, oh, hi, Todd. This is, uh, this is Todd, uh, and, and he was, uh, he gave me my first job when I was 14 years old in radio, and he's one of my oldest and, and, and best friends in life. And um, he has a lot of ghost stories. Um, so, I mean, I, it's hard to, to say he's a skeptic skeptic, but it's his own words. But um, he does, you know, he, he wants proof on things. Sure. And that's good. Um, he doesn't just give into it. Um, but there's been a lot of weird things that, that he's heard and witnessed, um, not only at the radio station that uh, we both used to work at. The one with the Underground Railroad. With the Underground tunnel. Railroad, yes. I hate that building. And there's plenty of, I mean, that's a, we could do a whole episode on that um, and just have him on to talk about that. Um, but um, there, there's a lot of, of weird things. So I, I'm, I'm, I, this is the first time I've heard this story from him. Um, but there was one night, one of my fondest memories of back, uh, I think my teenage years was, and there's not really, I can't say this is a ghost story, but I guess in a way, I guess it kind of is because it was just, it was so odd and out of the ordinary. We used to, on the weekends, go out and for extra money with uh, DJ weddings, you know? And um, I was about 16 or so at the time, and Todd was uh, probably, you know, just uh, turned around 30 or something, because I think I remember teasing him about that. Uh -huh. and, um, and I would go and help him uh, DJ the weddings on the weekend uh, sometimes to make a little extra money, and I loved hanging out and talking radio with him. and. One night, um, we had a, a wedding to DJ, and I don't even know where the hell it was. It was uh, way up in the woods somewhere uh, in Wisconsin. Um, the directions were, were scribbled down on a piece of paper, and this is pre-smartphone days. I mean, the best cell phones you had back then maybe were those Nokias. I think it was even prior to the Nokia-type phones. You may be still talking brick phone days or car phone days. Okay. Um, this is like 96. Seven ish um, and so we are trying to find this place where we're supposed to DJ this wedding at and we're driving and it's dark and it's fall um, it was I think it was October or November it was still around that time of year so already kind of that spooky vibe going on and uh, all the leaves had you know still were still kind of falling off the trees it was just creepy um, we're driving and driving and driving we can't find the damn place and we're to the point of almost giving up and turning around and saying, screw it, you know, your directions are off, we can't find this. 
eventually we go down this other road. Um, I think we're about ready to turn around. And we see this, this like light off in a distance. And we're like, well, let's just go see what it is. Cause we're in the country. Okay. These are just two lane country roads, woods, trees, and deer, mm-hmm. um, and a, a moon. And we see the light and we, it's the place. It's this hall that's off in, I, I think it was like a trailer park, honestly, uh, that it was in. I, I could be wrong, but I remember pulling into this area. There was lots of trailers and then it's hall, you know, or that gets rented out for events is, you know, essentially what it looks like. You know, your old 1950s or 60s type dance hall. Um, and we get in there and the the whole atmosphere was just weird. Um, It felt like we had walked into a different time. I can't say, I mean, the people weren't wearing like a different period of clothing or anything. I mean, but they weren't necessarily wearing like 1997 clothing either. It was just kind of generic where you could have taken them from any place. Um, So we go in, we DJ the thing. It was just kind of spooky. I go up to the bar to get a soda and they're serving glass bottles of soda. Now, this is 1997, the era when glass bottles were gone. You know, they're back today. You can buy them in pretty much any store. Uh, Up to about 1992 or 93, you could as well. And then they just got completely phased out of every store and it was pretty much plastic or cans. That's all you could get. Um, So it was weird. That was weird having, you know, getting a bottle. I remember going up to Todd going, look at this glass bottles of soda this is kind of neat and when we left on the way back when we just talked about ghost stories the whole way back and it it was just a freaky evening but that dance hall i'll never forget that night because it felt like we had gone back in time i still don't know where the hell it was and maybe Todd remembers but it was just a weird weird experience and i I don't want to say that we know we had ventured into some other dimension or something and we're teaching for ghosts or something because I think they all still really much enjoyed uh, when we played Come On Eileen and, uh, you know, all sorts of semi-modern songs. Uh, but it was just a weird night. Wow. So, I don't know. Yeah, that's a neat story. It was, you know, it was it was a very weird, weird evening. Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi, Tony. Hi, Jenny. I'm Shannon from Spokane. I have a ton of things to tell you. I've written one story to you before, but now I've worked up the courage to call you with this story. I'm very nervous, but I'll try not to fill my time with ums and ahs. And if I sound too rehearsed, I'm sorry, but I've written it down so I don't get lost in the middle of my story. (laughs) I was reminded of this happening by a couple of calls I heard on your show the other day. I'm still playing catch up, so I'm, uh, they probably aired a while ago, but, uh, anyway, it was, uh, stories about people uh, coming to say goodbye before while they're passing uh what i have to tell you isn't a haunting it's one of those goodbye visits my dad passed when i was 10 and he had had heart problems and had his aortic valve replaced it was 1968 so heart surgery was still pretty young he came through the surgery very well but there was so much damage already in his heart that he had two heart attacks had to be shocked back to life and then the third time it was just too much for his weak heart and he passed he had been in the hospital for a month and um we had we had a friend staying with us from out of state whose husband was also in the hospital and she and my mom were good friends so it was really great comfort for both of them we had a dog and that night he had been howling all evening and nothing made him stop If we brought him in the house, he'd just whine and scratch at the door to be let back out and go back to howling. My sisters and I were in school, and so we had to go to bed at our regular school bedtime. But being the baby, I got to sleep with my mom since these were special circumstances. Um, My sisters both had their own rooms upstairs. At around 1.30 in the morning, the phone rang, and I've been told that the dog stopped howling right then and didn't howl the rest of the night. I woke up when the phone rang, but I laid there trying to go back to sleep, but I had had a dream about my dad. There were a few things about him that I'll tell you, and then they'll make sense in a few minutes. 
as I continue my story. My dad worked shift work at a steel mill here in town, and my mom packed his lunch, as a lot of wives did back then. And the mill also gave out vitamin C to the workers, trying to keep them healthy. I loved these vitamins, and he always brought them home to me in his lunchbox. And when he'd come in, he'd hand me his lunchbox, and I'd get the vitamins out. <laughs> and he also smoked and rolled his own, as many men did, too. So that's a little backstory on him. Um, back to my story. In my dream, my dad came in the door from work, as he did every day that he worked, gave me his lunchbox, and I got the vitamins out, and he came through the kitchen into the dining room and sat at the dining room table. I came in and sat on his lap, and he rolled a cigarette and put it between his lips as if he was going to light it, before, but before he lit it, he swept the tobacco crumbs off the table with one hand into his other hand. Then he brushed them into the ashtray from his hand and wiggled his fingers like he was trying to get all the crumbs off. And this was his routine every day, so that was just normal. And then he told me he had to go, and he stood up. And I cried and begged him to stay, but he insisted that he had to go, but everything, that everything would be fine. And then he hugged me, and he walked out the back door. That's when I woke up. After a few minutes laying there in bed, trying to figure out, you know, why I had this dream, I was pretty upset, and so I called for my mom. And our friend that was with us, Mary Lou, yeah, that's her real name. She was a born and bred West Virginian. <laughs> um, she came in and tried to get me to go back to sleep, but I just really wanted my mom. So she got my mom, and my mom came in to comfort me. And when she came in, I told her about the dream, and she kind of looked at me strange. But then she told me that the hospital had just called and that my dad had just passed away. So I didn't think much about the dream after that because, of course, things got kind of busy and crazy. But the next day we were talking about things, and I found out that my sister had just come downstairs and told our mom about a dream that she had just had. It was the very same dream, with me sitting on his lap and begging him to stay. I know it sounds crazy, but even to this day, I can still, I can smell the tobacco, and I can just see exactly what he was doing. And uh, it was the exact same dream. It's just crazy. But <laughs> that was, uh, I'm sure, he, him coming to tell us goodbye. And the dog... He wasn't a howler by nature, but he howled on that day every year until he died about eight years later. Well, that's my goodbye bye visit. I feel so privileged to have this memory of my dad, and I know you guys have had questions about visits in our dreams. I don't know any more than you guys do, probably not as much, actually, but it was explained to me this way, and I've heard it a few times, and it really makes sense to me, that when our loved ones come to us in a dream, if it's so vivid that you just swear that it's real, if you can feel them touching you and like you've had a hug or that you're in the same room, that that's really a visit. And it's different than a regular dream because you don't have that same feeling. And that just really makes sense to me um, because it, it is, it's, it's so different. I've had both kinds of dreams. And the visit ones, you really do feel like you been with that person. So that's my story, and I'm so glad that you guys are doing this show. It's so great. We have a place to tell our stories and feel like somebody else understands what we're saying. Just love the show, and you guys are doing great. Thank you so much. Bye for now. There you go. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online, an encore presentation of some of our best ghost stories we've ever gotten. If you have a real ghost story, you can call it into us at 855-853-4802 or write in on the website, realghoststoriesonline.com. And remember, if you want more bonus episodes that you can feed off of anytime you want, just sign up to be an EPP through our website. That's an extra podcast person at realghoststoriesonline.com. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to Real Ghost Stories Online.